Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week, we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening, and let's get to it. Lift Your Legacy podcast with Rabbi Jacob Rupp this week is sponsored by liquidkosher.com. Elevate life's finest moments with our hand-picked boutique wine selections, including our exclusive wine from some of Europe's finest vineyards. Andrew Breskin, the kosher sommelier, is always a phone call away to help you choose your next favorite wine. And now you can save 10% on your first order using coupon code LEGACY. Visit liquidkosher.com or call us at 619-663-9613. And be sure to follow Liquid Kosher on Facebook and Instagram. So excited to have Dr. David Lieberman, who is one of the premier Jewish therapists and speakers in the world today. He's written 11 books. He's coming out with his 12th one in January, translated into 26 languages, and include two New York Times bestsellers. Um, He combines both Torah wisdom with his deep background in the world of psychology and Honestly, I was on the edge of my seat for the entire interview, so I know that we have a lot of great things in store for you today. Please check out his books. Um, there, he's actually there's a book that was just commissioned that instead of twenty dollars, it's actually two ninety nine. Um, his magnum opus, How Free Will Works, which I can personally recommend and is a phenomenal book. Check it out at your local Jewish bookstores. It's currently on sale for two ninety nine. Not bad. That's two dollars and ninety nine cents. So no further ado. Dr. David Lieberman. So you, you actually cross over both worlds, the world of Torah and, and all of the philosophy behind Torah, and also very practically as a, as a psychologist, how to live a productive and happy life. Um, the first time I became aware of your book, I was, we were walking, I was walking with a, a former employee of my, uh, excuse me, employer of mine, and uh, we were in a Jewish bookstore, uh, and she pulls out this book and she says, Oh, Rabbi, this is a great book for you. I want to show what it's called. It's called uh, Real Power, How to Rise Above Your Nature and Stop Feeling Angry, Anxious, or Insecure. So I was like, what are you saying about me? But uh, I ended up buying it, and I, and I loved it. It was fantastic. Dr. Lieberman, tell me a little bit about how you, in your life, came to psychology and Torah and how you sought to blend them together. The Torah obviously has everything that we need. It is the blueprints to reality itself and certainly it's an instruction book for living. Psychology offers what it offers, and very often it goes astray. And I've always been fascinated by certainly psychology. And you know, when I, I started looking more into Torah and Torah sources, I found just how rich it is in insights into human nature and human behavior, and just wipes the floor with any psychological, uh, strategies or tools or techniques or therapies that we have today and not to say that there aren't some very valuable models but the idea about integrating some of the Torah principles into the psychological uh, mainstream just was very very exciting and thank God it's been you know tremendously uh, successful but do you see bringing I guess, more practical psychological insights into the Jewish world as one of the major missions you have, or taking the information that is already there in the Torah and applying it more to the broader discussion about psychology and, and development. Right. So I'd say both. Actually, it's, it's um, I just finished a book for St. Martin's Press. They're not a Jewish publisher. They're in our regular, our regular, our regular that's a mainstream publisher. It's a book called uh, Never Get Angry Again. And the book is it's not out till January, I think uh, release date January 9, 2018. And in writing the book, I, um, I wanted to incorporate a lot of, of Torah principles, even though it's a secular book. And my editor sent back notes, and I remember it so well. She writes in the sideline, she goes, uh, David, she goes, you can talk about spirituality, you can talk about the soul, but I draw the line at God. And I thought, wow, really? That's why you're drawing the line, <laughs> God? So obviously I, I, I took a deep breath. It's a book on anger, so you, know, you can't scream at your editor. <laughs> and um, 
composed a very thoughtful and professional email and letting her know that this was non-negotiable uh, because if you want to talk about anger and why people fundamentally get angry, you have to talk about, there's, when I speak to people in a therapeutic sense, you know, a lot of times someone asks, how do you work with somebody who doesn't believe in God? And I say a very hard time, unless my job there is, is to help to explain how there is a creator, because unless you allow for a larger context of reality, you're going to hit a wall with questions like, you know, why did this happen to me? You know, why is this my mazel? <clears throat> why did I get stuck with this situation? So if you're very myopic in your lens, you're just going, again, to hit a wall. So I think bringing Torah concepts into the secular world is just very, very uh, exciting. At the same time, introducing the Torah community to proper psychological insights, because I, I, I can't straight this, state this enough, there are so many psychological approaches that are just ridiculous. They border on the obscene, and you know, no, no one in their right mind would adopt them. It's for the unaffiliated, I mean, you, you, oh, know, you have a oh. background. How do we, what's our barometer for what's outside the pale of what we should do? Excellent, good. Um, so, you know, that, that is a, a very good question. The problem first, the, the, the therapeutic model itself is fundamentally flawed, in, in my humble opinion, because, you know, if you go to the car mechanic and he doesn't fix your car, you, you got a bad mechanic. You go to the doctor and he doesn't fix your bone, you got a bad doctor. You go to the therapist, you don't get healthier, you're not trying hard enough. You don't care enough. Well, hold on, you know, <laughs> you know maybe you have, see, if the therapy is fundamentally flawed for a number of reasons. First off, unfortunately, there are just a lot of therapists who are just wacky. I mean, no, it is what it is. Um, in, any business, in any business, in any uh, field, you're going to find people that are just not emotionally solvent. The problem is, if you're a plumber or an accountant, okay. <laughs> If you're a therapist, <coughs> your lens is skewed, your, your perspective is off. Therefore, your advice is going to be distorted. Um, so that's one thing. Two is that, you know, the, the barometer in the rest of the world is if it makes sense, you've got something. By Torah, it has to be right. Like I'll tell you, when I write books for the secular community, the threshold, even though I, I certainly want to make it a, a good book, but I found when I started writing books for the tour community, my, my skills sharpen because you're more concise, you're more precise, and you can't say something without backing it up. And you can't, and you know, if you can go to the bookshelf in any self-help section of Barnes and Noble, find the three that are left, and you'll see a book saying, you know, the celebrate the power of being an introvert. Right next to it is, you know, how to come out of your shell and, and so on. Okay. Another book on, you know, relationships, on, you know, play. It, it, you could, you know, look, 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 turn on the Fox News or whatever the thing is. Listen to an expert from Harvard University on the stock market. They'll tell you it's definitely going to come up. The next guy to get on from Princeton, it's going to go down. You know, you have everyone with their own ideas, which is fine. The problem is if I want to get well, I want to get healthy, I don't want ideas, I don't want philosophies and ideologies, I want something that's grounded in reality. So the long answer to a very good short question is, first off, it's not always so easy to tell, but here are a couple of uh, sort of tools I encourage people to take into the therapy session. Number one is this, the research shows that more important than the type of therapy is your rapport and connection with the therapist. If you don't like, trust, or respect your therapist, wish them well and find somebody else. Only because you're just not, unless it's for something like a very, like I call it a spot illness, something you're just going in and out for, but you can't have a relationship, professional relationship, with someone who you don't like, trust, and respect. Next, if you're not making progress after a reasonable period of time, call it three months to six months, it makes sense to you know, begin to look at other avenues. Three, if you get a diagnosis from any psychiatrist, get a second opinion. The number of misdiagnoses, uh, misdiagnoses is so high that it's almost the fact that whatever diagnosis you get is wrong. So, I, you know, and, and the problem is, if you go to a psychiatrist and he diagnoses with XYZ, 
You're now going to be on a medication, which is going to side effects and so on. And again, it's the, the psychiatric and the psychological systems out there can be life-saving, but you have to apply some common sense and you have to do your due diligence. If I would want to assume more control over my life, if I want to stop getting angry, if I want to start building my self-esteem, but what are some of the principles that you would suggest right away that a person could take away? Excellent. So end of the day is this, and that is that <clears throat> there is no pill, there is no book, there is no pep talk that's going to change your life unless you make different choices. The quality of our lives comes down to the quality of our choices. As a matter of fact, research shows that, listen to this, something called the lottery curse, you may be familiar with that term. People that win a million dollars or more after one year have a higher statistical rate of suicide, drunken driving, divorce, and bankruptcy. All the money did was give them more opportunities to make lousier choices than they could before. Circumstances will come and go. They'll put us in a good mood, put us in a bad mood. But fundamentally, how I feel about myself and my life hinges on the quality of my choices. And the more responsible I am, and that ultimately is our requirement, our obligation in any situation, is to take responsibility. Which is why chuva, a topic unto itself, is so important, because it allows for us to sort of wipe clean that emotional and spiritual slate and move forward without the baggage. But fundamentally, if I decide, I choose to make more responsible choices, I will infuse myself with a greater sense of self-esteem. If I make choices that are reckless, irresponsible, below my spiritual level, our madrega, then it's going to no way and eat uh, at my conscience, my soul, which brings us to shame. And shame fundamentally is what is, it's sort of the voice of our conscience, our neshama, sort of gnawing at us saying we've done something that is beneath us. So we're going to have a heart, which brings us to childhood in and of itself, uh, this conversation. But if you're looking for sort of one direction to go in, in terms of infusing yourself with self-esteem, it's not, it's not going to be found in anything that anyone will tell you. It will be found in you changing the quality of your choices and choosing to be someone who's more responsible and you will like yourself more. Um, if a person's dealing with a lot of stress, how do, does that message, which is extremely practical, how does that not add the level of stress? How can you talk a person down and say, oh great, so the reason why I'm so stressed out and you know, the financially making things work and, and raising a family and my marriage and my kids, how do you chunk it down, I guess you can say, where it doesn't seem overwhelmingly um, suffocating and kind of raising the stress that we're under? Excellent, so first, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a rabbi in, in uh, Israel by the name of Rabbi Yitzhak Berkowitz. And he was giving a shir, giving a talk, and he said the following, which I repeated so often. He said, God wants you to be normal. And I was like, wow, well, of course he does. But, you know, what, what does it mean? So there are a lot of stressors. And once again, we, we, go off, it, we can go off into a whole other talk on stress. But first off is that the healthier my perspective is, the more clearly I see reality as I enter my day and my world, the more easy it will, easier it will be for me to digest my reality in a healthy way. If you come into a situation <clears throat> with a narrow, distorted, or skewed perspective, it's going to be easy for anything to throw you off balance. You get two red lights in a row, you'll be upset. Your child spills it, you get upset. So the first thing is to make sure that you orient your day, your life, with as wide a perspective as possible. The Medrash says that Adam and Rishon, Adam the first man, could see from one end of the earth to the other. What that means is before the Yates of horror, the serpent incarnate, the ego became internalized, man's perspective was unfettered. We could see clearly. Only once the ego becomes inside of us do we begin to see through this cloudy lens of I. The degree to which we accept responsibility is the degree to which we purge ourselves of the ego. Which Wait, can, can, you, so, can you slide that? That was awesome. So, so, so the, what, tell me a little bit more about the cloudiness of the I and the ego. Sure. So here's how it works. Self-esteem and, e and the ego are like a seesaw. When one goes up, the other goes down. The more self-esteem I have, which is not confidence, the two are often confused. One has zero to do with the other in adults. By children, it's a little bit different. But self-esteem refers to the degree to which I love myself. I feel worthy of good things in life. I'm a good person. <clears throat> Create the image of God. As my choices become less responsible or refuse to take responsibility for myself in my life, my self-esteem is going to decrease but I don't want to feel that pain 
of being irresponsible. So my ego engages, and it is the false self. It is the Yetzirah, and it exists to compensate my own feelings of guilt, inferiority, and shame, anything I'm not willing to face and acknowledge. The job of the ego is to put on a show. It is a facade, an image that we sell the rest of the world. The wider the gap between who I am and this image, the more draining it is. And you know this is true in your own life. Whenever you try to put on airs, put on a show, twist and contort, move away from what you know is right and responsible to win someone else's praise, it eats away your self-respect. Right? So the more authentic, the more true, the more honest we are with ourselves, with our, in our lives, with the people in our lives, the less room there is for the ego and the clearer the reality. It's the ego that blocks perspective because rather than see reality, I see a projection of my own wants and needs because let's just understand and break down the connection between ego and perspective and why it blocks it. The more self-esteem I have, the more vested interest I have in seeing reality. In other words, I want to invest in me. I love me in a genuine, healthy sense. But if I'm making poor choices and I don't like me very much, my ego engages and I don't want to feel the pain of remorse or of guilt or that I've hurt somebody else or that I'm not making the calls I need to make or not, you know, taking care of myself emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically. So my ego is going to engage. The job of the ego is to sell us on another narrative. There's reality perspective, and then there's a false narrative of the ego. The narrative of the ego is, oh, don't worry about it. You could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Don't worry about it. He's not a nice guy anyway. Don't worry about it. You had a lousy childhood, blame your parents and enjoy the sandwich. Whatever it is, my ego is going to sell me on something that's not true. And that's why it interferes and corrupts our ability to see reality. If you have written, you have written so many books and so many of your books have this amazing principle of you're going to reach a point. You just mentioned you're never going to get angry again. You're going to rise above your nature. I'm just looking at the books of yours that I have on my, on my, on my table over here. Um, very often, you know, it's very hard to reach that point where you actually have that experience. And, and you yourself mentioned you're writing a book about anger, and then you have to kind of qu- you know, quench, qu- calm the anger to explain to the publisher. And, and you've written 11 different books that are talking about, I'm assuming, you know, the same concepts of, of taking control of your life and living a productive life and being happy. Do you advocate depth or breadth? I read hundreds of books. Is it better that I read one and I know it well? D- d- does that make sense? It, it does. So I would politely suggest it depends on what you're reading. You know, in other words, <coughs> if you're reading something that makes sense and it's proper and it's good, then I would encourage you to take the time to integrate it into your life. If you're reading to acquire knowledge, then certainly, you know, you, you, it would make sense to go just sort of skim along. Um, but at the end of the day, look, if there was a single self-help book that worked, they would keep on printing that one and that's all that would be in the bookstores. So, the Bible. Yeah, the Bible, right, Exactly. They're the most popular self-help book ever written. But the reason why there are so many different books is because some, quite frankly, they obviously, they don't work. And they don't work for everyone. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And you're going to see, like, I've had people tell me just the most beautiful things, life-changing things about my books. And then I've also had people say, it's, you know, they can't get through the introduction, let alone, you know, the acknowledgments. It just doesn't speak to them. And they would rather, you know, a book deliver the message in a different format. And I get that. I'm just, it's not my, my, uh, you know, my forte to be able to write in that style, but certainly there are millions and millions of people who appreciate it. So you're going to want to find, you know, authors and books that speak to you and your style. Uh, But the end of the day is nothing works unless you do. You know, if, if we're all looking for that diet book that will tell us we don't have to eat less and exercise, we're looking for that parenting book that will tell us, you know, you don't have to spend time with your child and you can go do what you want. You know, we're looking for that, you know, book on, you know, financial, um, you know, on, on finances that will tell us just to sit around in bed all day and, and stick your hand out. It doesn't exist. You have to do something. You have to do your stylish. You have to do your effort. The results is up to God. But when we talk about taking responsibility, we talk about doing, not simply absorbing more information and reading and so on. 
So I want to just jump into this concept of the results being up to God, especially as you're going out and trying to educate the, the, the world uh, to this concept of God and incorporating God in your life as a step or a necess- I guess you could say as the, as the pedestal of mental health. Yeah. How do you rectify or how do you explain the concept of God as, you know, well, whatever God's will will be versus I have to make this effort. How does a person not rely on God to the point that they don't take action, but rely on the on God once they have taken action. Excellent. Because people have a fundamental misunderstanding about what it means to have betachen, trust in God. It doesn't mean that I can lie in bed all day, eat cheese, uh, cheese doodles, and read the newspaper, and everything will be taken care of. Trust in God means that I'm going to do my effort, my ishtadis, my work, and the results are up to him. And whatever happens as a consequence of my efforts will be good. That's what it means to have trust. A person that doesn't engage the real world isn't really trusting. They're convincing themselves that they have trust when really they're simply lazy, which, you know, quite frankly, is, you know, will package as fear, will package as procrastination, will package as perfectionism. End of the day, there is what to say for being lazy, which is a muscle, it's a meter, and you can. Uh, work on. I think there are a number. Actually, I know there are a number of chapters in the book on free will about maximizing willpower. Because once I wrote the first section of the book, by the way, on how and why free will works, it became sort of clear that people may want sort of practical, sort of now what tools. But anyone that does nothing doesn't really trust in God. Anyone that works and works their fingers to the bone also doesn't trust in God. It requires that balance of knowing that you have to do what's reasonably responsible and God will take care of everything else. That's what Ashtabas is. That's what trust is. And that's amazing. I read, I actually, I cited in your book, it's page 272 in, in your new book, uh, where, where you speak about that experience of what, what it, of the Jews going out into the desert and the desert offering them no protection. So, could you just, I guess, maybe build out why should everybody essentially try to connect to that story? Is that not just true for the Jewish people, but true for the entire world? Does everyone have to have that period of sort of giving up and seeing everything falling around them and then still surviving in order to move forward? Like, how do you, how do you see that story or that concept? Right. So in, in general, you know, what happens when you have somebody, you know, that, that, that anecdotic side, um, who is going through a difficult time? We often hear, you know, people talk about hitting rock bottom. And, you know, what does that mean to, to hit rock bottom? And, and it really means that there is no longer an ego. If you look at the 12 steps, you know, agree or disagree, they all have one thread that runs through it, which is humility. Because as long as you think you're the center of the universe, uh, you're going to have a hard time praying. <laughs> because who, to whom are you praying? It actually was fascinating. I was just reading. Somebody gave over with Dr. Abraham Tversky. Uh, had written about, he, he's a big proponent of AA, and he said that a, some, a sponsor was working with somebody who was a self-proclaimed atheist, and the sponsor said he wasn't going to work with this person until he was willing to pray to God. And the atheist said, I don't believe in God, because I want you to pray anyway. After two months, the man was doing amazingly well, and the sponsor said, well, you know, no, are you still praying to God? He said, yes. He says, I want you to know, I don't yet believe in God, but now I know that I'm not him. You know, and, and, you know, the ego will convince us that we're the center of the universe, that we're in charge, and that, which is why, you know, we talk about the ego blocking perspective, it also corrupts our ability to trust in God, because how can I trust in God if I put all of my trust in me? Right? In other words, if I'm all there is, and I think, I remember t- someone just recently was telling me they're going through a difficult period, and they said, you know what, I just gave it over to God. You know, I said, when you gave it over to God, like a baton relay, now that it's hard, you're just going to give it to him, and if it crashes and burns, who do you think was in charge all along? You know, and when you really bring God into your life, day in and day out, we wake up in the morning, we say a bracha. We say a blessing. Thank you, God, for returning my, thank you for me waking up. It sort of frames our day in appreciation. And then if you have the idea that, okay, now what can I do for you, God, or what can I do to maximize, you know, this gift, it's a whole different world than schlepping yourself out of bed, complaining it's early, and that, you know, you can't find your slippers.
And not, uh, Ray Dalio, who has, I think, the world's biggest hedge fund, just put out a book called Principles, and it sort of reads a lot of themes of, uh, yeah, he's, he was, he was in, like, like Steve Jobs, who was a child of the 60s and was really kind of affected by that whole world and went to India. And one of the points that he spoke, he said he wrote, he wrote about, he spoke to Dalai Lama about, was this idea that man is capable of producing within himself the ex experience, I guess you could say, of, of connecting to God. And he brings all this, you know, science for that, about how certain feelings and chemicals in our brain release that feeling of connection. If a person's speaking to you and saying, you know, doctor, if I, I, if I buy that part, which I get is, is opposite of, of, of the Jewish perspective, the Jewish perspective is that there is actually a God. What would you say that's, that's good enough that you could sort of remove the entire system and still get the benefits of believing in God, kind of like the, the, the story from, from a, the AA guy, you know, that, okay, I, I understand how it's beneficial to believe in God. Or would you push a, a client or a friend of yours, say, even if, let's say a guy who's not Jewish, say, no, there's actually really a God. And if you have that perspective, you're going to be fundamentally flawed. Yeah, beautiful question. Look, mental health requires an allegiance to reality at all costs and consequences. There's no such thing as a partial truth. You know, you hear these pundits, uh, pundits on the news, and it's, you know, I heard a great one. You know, we heard about alternate truths, and this other guy said, yeah, he, there were some truth deficits. It's a lie, truth deficits, it's a lie. So you wanna say, you know, it's a little bit like this, it's like being a little pregnant, so on. Reality is reality. You can color it, you can shade it, you can distort it, you can look away. It's like the child that goes like this, and he thinks he disappears. It is reality. You can't ignore reality without ignoring the ability to optimize your mental health. So is it better to recognize that you're not God than to think you are? Okay, sure. But ultimately, you want to live in the real world. Mental health requires my ability to see, accept, and respond to my world. That means I see reality, I accept it, and respond. That's what it means to be healthy. Anything short of that, you compromise your mental health. So when you're stuck, I mean, you know, the Jewish world has the Torah and we have a lot of sources that were written that explain different components of the Torah. We have books that talk about character development. As a Jewish person, how, where do you look? What do you look for? How do you start to build this experience? How much are you trying to borrow from outside and how much are you trying to create, I guess you could say, if I'm reading your book, I'm like, well, this, this is amazing. I never, I never read it about, you know, the Jews coming out of Egypt like this. I never realized it was talking about mental health. So to what extent can you advocate how a person should go along that path of figuring out mental health from traditional sources, I guess you could say? Okay, great. So first, if I can just, um, uh, just rethread the conversation we're speaking about in terms of, you know, what it means to be healthy and Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, was the humblest of men, right? We know he was, he was also the greatest leader of the Jewish people. He saw reality, spoke to reality with a capital R. He had no ego. Korach, on the other hand, um, or Bilam, they were entirely egocentric. And we, we know how things unfolded for them. So, you know, greatness, being humble is not about being weak or, or, or meek. Getting your ego out of the way means you have a relationship with reality. De facto, you're more in touch with your soul, your neshama, because it's a facet of reality, a facet of God. We know people who are egocentric or ego-oriented, and they live for this image. They are so isolated. They're so out of touch with their true selves. They're cut off from God, and they're cut off from everyone else. So they're completely... Um, their emotional health isn't only compromised, but they're certainly not, not happy people. And the answer to your question in terms of sort of integrating everything, it's hard to digest concepts that are true if you're leaky yourself. If you are clear vessel, you know, that is um, got some, you know, more than a couple of cracks in it, it's very hard to hold on to it. So if there was sort of an olive face or a step one in terms of moving yourself from unhealthy to healthy. And I just want to be clear, we're painting with the broad brush. There are a number of pe reasons why people would be depressed or anxious or emotionally unwell, having absolutely positively nothing to do with their own choices. So let's, let's be clear about that. But for the rest of us, the number one thing to do would come back to what we spoke about before. And that is that to create yourself into a clea, into a vessel that's just healthier so you can hold more. Meaning I want to begin to take more responsibility. And you'll see this is true again in your own life. If you look at the areas of your life and decide to be more authentic, to be more honest, 
And the beginning of authenticity is to acknowledge where you've you know, been lying to yourself. And it's a painful conversation to have. But when you say to yourself, okay, who am I blaming for my problems, for my issues, for my stuff? And maybe there are people who you can legitimately point the finger to. But right here, right now, my objective is to be responsible. And we find that, you know, the end of the day, the quality of our lives comes down to the quality of our choices. So if I want to be healthier and I want to learn more and integrate more, I've just got to be a healthier, more whole person. And that's going to require me moving my life in a more meaningful, purposeful direction. You will find that once you begin to make better choices, what you read, what you listen to, what you uh, absorb will be able to be retained and utilized as fuel, much more so than if you came into it uh, you know, less healthy and less willing to acknowledge where you are and to work on yourself. Two final questions. As someone who is, uh, you know, immersed in the world of Jewish thought and work, immersed in the world of, of psychology, what do you find is the most difficult thing for you to be working on? Or is like, is an annoying thing? Like, what's your biggest challenge? Me personally? Wow. Well, Please. That, that is one long list. <laughs> you know, so I, I you know, as, as, as a human, suffer with everything everyone else does. The one small advantage I would have is after writing about it for decades, talking you know, 100 and probably 50 speeches a year, it eventually sort of sinks in and you just realize sometimes the insanity of not being real. And not because I'm so evolved as a person, just because when you live and breathe this and advocate it, you can't help but absorb some of it. Um, but really, I would say my issue that I have is the same that everyone else has, and that is you know, when you're faced with a situation, you have a choice to either accept it or to deny it. And that's really ultimately what our Vodas Hashem, our job as human beings comes down to. And that was the original, the original sin. Either you accept reality or you ignore it. And the ego has many tools in its tool belt. Deny, justify, rationalize, minimize. Or I could face the pain. And that's what emotional health is. That's what maturity is. It's the willingness to face the pain of a situation now, knowing I'll be in a better situation tomorrow. But if I ignore it, it doesn't go away. And all that pain just simply manifests into suffering. So the, the long answer again to your very good short question is to remind myself that you know, you're better off taking your medicine now, dealing with reality now. It could be difficult, it could be unfun, it could be um, uninspiring, it could be confusing, it could be taxing, emotionally draining, physically draining, but if you do it, you'll feel better and you'll feel better about yourself and your life. It's beautiful. You're the, you're the first person that said I had short questions. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, the, my, final, my final question for you is, you know, we see ourselves in a world of tremendous instability. There's, you know, working with individuals, certainly if you're looking on a national level, there's a lot to be upset about, frustrated about, not sure about. When you're looking at the future, say you can say is the Jewish future at the at, you know where mental health is going. What are you most excited about? What do you think is the greatest opportunity that you are involved with that you're seeing happening at the current time? Beautiful, it's a beautiful question. I, I'm most excited about the possibility of helping people to live a life that they couldn't have imagined. I know it sounds so cliche and and motivational speakery. What I mean by that is that too often we settle on a marriage that's workable. We settle for a relationship with our kids that is manageable. When really small differences can make a profound difference in the quality of relationships in our lives. And when you open people's eyes to the possibility of transforming, not incrementally, but quantumly, just the quality of their lives, they don't have to settle for blah when they can really enjoy a much better relationship with their children, with their spouse, with their sibling, with their parents, whomever it is, and well as move their life in the direction they want it to go, to be able to get rid of those fears. Think of who we would be today if we didn't have the problems that we have. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, but if we didn't have the fears holding us back, so what are those fears? Where do they come down to? And when you begin to look at them and tackle them, which is painful, as we said before, but they begin to dissolve. And it's like just taking the shackles off and moving forward. 
Amazing. Okay, Dr. Lieberman, the best way for people to reach you, I know that you had mentioned, I want to just mention it again, that Feldheim is releasing uh, 5,000 copies of your best-selling book, How Free Will Works, which goes through both from a Jewish perspective, I guess, How Free Will Works and everything that goes there, and then practical steps of, as we mentioned, a lot of things we talked about in, in our talk about getting more self-esteem, how to live the life that you really want. Um, so Feldheim's releasing that for a very limited time. The copies will be $2.99, $2.99 at your local Jewish bookstore. Uh, we, I guess we have to see if that'll be available online, but how do people reach you and uh, want to get a hold of you for personal discussions or speaking or whatever it might be? Got it. So first, let me uh, invite anyone that wants, there's a, um, if you want a, a free ebook of another book, the book you mentioned, Real Power, if, uh, can I give out a text number? Yeah. You just text the word lecture to the phone number 313131. I'm not a technologically savvy guy, but through the world of magic and technology, text, text the word lecture to the phone number 313131. You get a, a free download of, of that book, as well as I think handouts for a, a talk I give on Tor Anytime. It's a weekly ongoing share. Uh, they can go to my website if you want, uh, which is drdrdavidlieberman.com. Um, and there's some speaking info there. Amazing. Dr. Lieberman, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. It was a pleasure speaking with you. It is my pleasure. Lots of good luck to you. Amen. There you have it, folks. Another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, We have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.